you use the term perfectly, you know, all or nothing. And quite often people who are successful in whatever it is that they do will class themselves as all or nothing. And it, like when you look at it, it's like, well, go figure, of course, because if you're all or nothing, it means the things that you do do, you do to a very high standard. You go all in on it. You put lots of attention and care there. And when I started looking at different areas of my life on a sliding scale rather than this binary thing of it's good or it's bad, it removes some of the pressure. Like my training is not now, or my physique is not now good or bad. It's maybe on this sliding scale, a little bit lower down the scale. That's absolutely fine because again, other areas of my life are higher up on the scale than they were previously. So today, we're finally meeting face to face and this is, it's just a really nice experience actually. Um, We've worked together for, was it coming up to six months in yeah. terms of like business mentorship yeah. and the lessons that I've learned throughout this process have been invaluable. And I think as well, um, something that's super important that loads of people don't really recognize or underestimate is the network and the community of like-minded individuals. Yeah. So that's something that I think you bring to the table massively with your client list. And I wanted to get on this face-to-face -face podcast to just talk to you, pick your brain, talk mindset, talk business, yeah. and all sorts of things. So I think it's, it's natural really to start at the point of where it all began for you, because I know that things have changed massively over the last few years. Um, so let's start there. Where, where did the whole fitness journey into where it is now? Um, so I guess from the standpoint of like coaching, coaching started for me donkeys ago in the military. Uh, I was an army physical training instructor, so one of my roles in the military was to train the guys in the regiment and, and help them with their fitness and so on. And so that's kind of like, that was my first leg in the door with coaching. And that's really where I kind of found my passion for it. And then upon leaving the military, starting my personal training business, and that went really well. And today, coaching, for, I'm still coaching, but in a different sense, as you've already alluded to with supercharge and mentoring, coaching is is now working with personal trainers and online coaches like yourself and helping them build their business and helping them um, you know, achieve the things that they want to achieve. And that really came about at the start of the first lockdown when coronavirus hit, um, really just quite organically. I think, if I'm honest with myself, I had envisioned that one day I would do the mentoring thing. It's something that I've mm -hmm. always kind of wanted to do and, and having done lots of mentorships myself and invested a lot in, in my own coaches, I knew that I could do it. It just, coronavirus really just kind of fast-tracked that for me because people reached out, they wanted advice into you know, their systems and how they, they pivot into online coaching from, from in-person PT because nobody could PT anymore. So it just, yeah, it fast-tracked the whole thing for me. Um, and Supercharge, as you know, and actually you can be testament to this, Dan, Supercharge has changed a lot from when it started and what it was initially to kind of what it is now and where it's going. So. Um, it's ever changing. It's definitely not the finished article, but, but yeah, I am proud of it mm. as it stands. It's really cool. I think the first lockdown was such an interesting experience. Obviously, terrible at the same mm. time, but so many people, as you said, it, it, it was a perfect uh, example of adapt or die mm. because all of a sudden everything changed overnight. Mm. People couldn't get into their workplaces, and so many of my friends that would, were PTs face to face were panicking and they were yeah. like, you know, I've got bills to pay. Um, you know, some of them weren't able to get any of the grants or, or yeah. you know, bonus things that were out at the time. And, you know, they messaged me as well because they knew that I'd been doing online coaching for a while. They were like, help, yeah. everyone panicked. So the fact that it went from, because I signed up in the first, after the first lockdown, because yeah. I was like, right, I want to take it up a notch. And that was when it was like just at the beginning of the, yeah. The enterprise of, yeah. of where Supercharge began. Yeah. Um, so it is interesting to see it then obviously like a year later, came back, did another, and now I'm back on board for another six months. Yeah. So it's very, very interesting. And, and now the other things that you're doing as well in terms of the events, yeah. and it's really cool to see that growth actually. Uh, one thing that I was really curious to know is there's always a natural transition between when you change a role because your identity becomes wrapped up in, you know, what you were doing. Yes. Um, your ego, I suppose. And I experienced it, and I know that you've changed 
faces, I suppose, lots of times. You know, when years ago you were competing, before yeah. that you were in the military, face-to-face -face PT, online, now mentoring. How has that kind of affected you as you've gone through? It de yeah, you're, you're right. I, I definitely have changed a lot over the years. And um, I think you have to, you know, because when you put yourself in a position where you're talking about different things or you're helping different people, you kind of need to embody that and you, you do need to change your demeanor, the way that you speak, the way that you present yourself. All of these different things do need to change in line with the new mission, so to speak. And it's actually been one of the things that has been almost like one of my one of my skills or superpowers, if you like, over the years is being able to adapt and change who I am as a person, N not at the core, like my, you know, my values and all of those things are still the same, mm -hmm. but being able to change, you know, the way that I present myself is something that comes quite natural to me. Um, it does come with its challenges still. Um, you still suffer with things like imposter syndrome, you know, that identity crisis of like, who am I to be doing this? You know, you, f you feel like you don't deserve a seat at the table at times. It's like, mm -hmm. how did I get myself into this position and should I really be here or am I just blagging it, you know? But one of the things that I'm learning more and more about things like imposter syndrome is that it's, it's typically a good thing and it's, it's often an indication to the fact that you're probably in a place where you're growing, where you're pushing yourself, you're doing new things. And in fact, if you're not feeling those feelings of quote unquote imposter syndrome, then there's a good chance that you're coasting. Mm. So um, I, I welcome it now and I, and I don't mind feeling like a bit of a fraud at times. And I think we all are to some degree, you know, we are all just blagging it. But I think if at the core of that, you're doing your best by the people that you serve, whether that's in your business or your, your personal life, then you can't go too far wrong. You know, I've got, I've got my people's best interests at heart. So um, I can live with that feeling of imposter syndrome from time to time. Mm. I think it's very interesting because I had a conversation on a recent podcast as well. Um, there appears to be like two camps really with this kind of thing. Um, you've got people that the more I spend time with people in business, they're very, very growth orientated. Mm. They're very comfortable being uncomfortable. Yeah. Or maybe they're not comfortable, but they're willing to go into those regions, those areas yeah. of just sheer uncomfort, mm. fright, you know, yeah. imposter syndrome. Where do you think that started? Like, where do you think you suddenly clicked and were like, okay, I recognize now that when I go into those areas, that's when like I ramp up. I, I think, yeah, it's definitely true. You know, some people have more aptitude for those feelings of discomfort and, and, and ultimately will be the people who make success of things because there will be tough times. There are going to be times where it doesn't go to plan. And quite often that's the, that's the very reason in which people don't try in the first place. I'm very fortunate in that through my childhood and my upbringing and, and, and my earlier years of life weren't very much rose tinted, shall we say. And so I've got great perspective on what hardship actually is mm -hmm. and quite often with that context if i'm making difficult decisions around shall i take this risk shall i make this transition is this too bold a move with that context and that perspective of what i've had previously in, in my previous life it all seems a little bit farcical it's all a little bit like well if it all goes tits up does it really matter mm -hmm. i'm probably going to be all right like and i think quite often people look at their past and if they've got traumatic experiences and all these different things that have happened to them in their life, they really hone in on that as a negative. But I honestly, again, see it as a bit of a superpower for me. I, I've got this amazing perspective of what hardship really is. And so making difficult decisions around business or whatever isn't a massive concern for me because mm. it, it's tiny in the grand scheme of things. So again, it's a game of perspective and it's, it's served me well over the years. And, and uh, I've been able to, to make difficult decisions that other people maybe wouldn't because of that. Mm. And how do you separate that, purely on a selfish question this is, how do you separate that from uh, the ego? Because you know when you get to a certain level of business or a certain level of achievement, and then all of a sudden things don't necessarily align with yeah. your perception or where you feel like you should be, mm. how do you then continue moving forwards in a direction without that being a detriment or as an extension to that so many people often suffer with the materialistic or trying to impress other people yeah. 
So how, how do you balance those two? E ego is a massive thing, and I don't for one second to claim to have it right by any stretch of the imagination. And this new kind of thing that I'm doing now with like the business coaching and growing supercharge and all that sort of stuff, there isn't, that, that it feels as though there should be some sort of identity attached to that. Like if you're not successful yourself, how can you help other people be successful? If you're not making money, then how can you help other people make money? Mm -hmm. And so some of that is branding, some of it is appearance. And I identify as that successful person now. But the reality is, is that you're not always going to be crushing it every month. You're not always making all the money every month. You do have clients leave. You do have clients pause. You have all of the same trials and tribulations that other people face. And actually, it's probably even more stressful because it's at a higher scale. You're playing with bigger numbers. And so, you know, it can be really difficult. And, and I've battled with it recently, if I'm honest, where like, my identity is now this quote unquote successful person and it needs to be. And so when we have a difficult time in the business or whatever, well then that's me failing as an individual now because I'm supposed to be Ollie Carson, the successful person or whatever. So I have, I have dug deep and tried to detach myself from that. But sometimes you can't, you know, sometimes that is part of who you are. And so ego, ego can serve you if you're, if you're consciously aware of it and if you understand what your ego is and you use it to your advantage, some people let their ego get in their way and, and, and it becomes, like you say, a detriment to them. So again, I think self-awareness is really important there. Yeah, I, de I definitely think you're right. I, I had a similar experience at the Arnold's. I went to the Arnold's this weekend. Yeah. And a few years ago, um, you know, five, six years ago, that was my, my bread and butter. Yeah. You know, I was there, I was it's so wrapped up in the industry. And over the years, it's just naturally transitioned that as it focused more on business, I've kind of stepped away from that element of things. I've, I've been coaching more, I've been focusing on business and, uh, and networking uh, outside of the element of bodybuilding and, yeah. and competing. And it was weird this time going back, and normally obviously it was body power back in the day, yes. and I still have my attachments to that company. But going back to the Arnold's, and not having that same level of like interaction that yeah. I would normally have, yes. it was a weird moment for me, I'll be honest. It was, it was almost a bit like, I was so torn between, do I still want to be here? Yeah. Or am I like striving to a different direction and a different purpose now? And it was, I was really torn in that moment. Yes, uh, and I've had a similar sort of thing as well. You, you almost feel as though you're losing relevance in certain areas. But then the question that you kind of need to ask yourself is, well, do you still want to be relevant in that area? Or in order for you to grow and, and go to whatever the next level is for you, do your circles need to change? Do the shoulders that you rub with potentially change? And the answer is quite often yes. Yeah. And so, again, that's a bit of an ego thing of like, Hang on, I used to be top bollocks walking around the NEC Birmingham, you know, or <laughs> whatever. Body, and every, yeah, pants. And everyone knew who I was and people were asking for pictures and all this stuff. Yeah. And you're, you're maybe not that person anymore, but are there other areas of your life that are, are perhaps on the upward trajectory and improving like business, like, mm. you know, all the, the, the impact that you have on your own clients? And that's absolutely fine. So, again, that kind of word of self-awareness comes back and being able to look at things subjectively and go, Sure, that's not where it was, but actually I'm improving in other areas that are important to me now. You know, it's fine for your values and your wants and desires to change. It's really interesting because I've done a lot of self-development work and noticing that kind of like um, ego really kick in on the weekend mm. was such a bizarre experience because I, I literally was like, yeah, you know, I, I made a conscious decision because you know yourself, there's no money in fitness modeling unless mm. you're top 1%, yes. massive, massive following on social media. Yeah. There's absolutely no money in it. But like the ego kick, I think that I used to get, it used to fulfill so much that yes. I previously wasn't working on. Yeah. You know, the, the, the body, mm -hmm. um, you know, the ego of winning a medal, yeah. you know, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And just the, you know, you know what it's like, the, the, the ultimate, I think, sacrifice that so many people can't do. Yes. Even that gives you the kind of, like, yeah, you know. it, it puts you on some sort of imaginary pedestal that you create for yourself where it's yeah. like, you know, and, and, it, and it often does, and it's so common to say this, and I don't want to sound like a cliche, but it often does stem from a place of insecurity, whether we admit it or not, 100%. you know, trying to tick those boxes of looking a certain way or being accepted by people based on the way you look. But the reality is, is like when you, when you come to realize that actually nobody really 
cares about the way that you look. Everyone's so self-absorbed with mm -hmm. their own stuff that they've got, and got going on and, and all of those kind of things. You, you might get that initial compliment or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. but beyond that, how does that serve you? It really doesn't, you know? And so I'm, and, and you know, similar to you, and I'm not saying this as, as, a, as, a, as a jive at you, but our focuses and attention have shifted quite a lot over the last few years. And perhaps we don't look the best we've ever looked. And sometimes that can be a kicker, but you, you have to constantly step back and go, but all of these other things are going amazingly. And so let's focus on that. Mm -hmm. I'm really guilty of being very all or nothing. Mm. So my issue is over the last six months, business has been the best it's ever been for me. But my training, I mean, we've spoken about it multiple times. Yeah. My training has gone to absolute pop. Mm -hmm. um, when I've been in India, the schedule's crazy. Obviously, I'm doing stuff in India. Then I've got the online business as well. Yeah. So training has been the bottom of my priority list. Yeah. And the issue that I've always found with like my energy is I've basically prioritized what I see as the more important tasks, yes. which is business, my clients, but then myself has been left down to the bottom of the pile, yeah. which ultimately I know logically is not the best way to do things mm. because you can't serve from an empty cup, right? Yeah. And that's one of my favorite phrases because it's so true. Yes. How do you personally, with everything that you've got going on, mm. how do you balance that? Because it's so, I mean, you're on a different level in terms of the numbers, as you said, but when people, and when you've got that much pressure mm. from a business, how do you manage the, okay, I need to push this aside mm. and then like still focus on myself. I do, again, I'm not the perfect article with this by any stretch of the imagination. And, you know, similar to you, my training has taken an, an impact and the, the amount of kind of quote unquote self care that I, I pay attention to has diminished over time as things have grown and got busier. Um, but I, I now view things on a sliding scale. You use the term perfectly you know, all or nothing. And quite often people who are successful in whatever it is that they do will class themselves as all or nothing. And mm -hmm. it, like when you look at it, it's like, well, go figure, of course, because if you're all or nothing, it means the things that you do do, you do to a very high standard. You go all in on it. You put lots of attention and care there. And when I started looking at different areas of my life on a sliding scale, rather than this binary thing of it's good or it's bad, it removes some of the pressure. Like mm. my training is not now, or my physique is not now good or bad. It's maybe on this sliding scale, a little bit lower down the scale, but that's absolutely fine because again, other areas of my life are higher up on the scale than they were previously. Um, Simon Sinek said it amazingly on a podcast recently where, you know, everything is in balance, that it's not good or bad. Everything comes at a cost and everything has a benefit as well. So things might be going swimmingly with the business for you right now, but at the cost of what? Yeah. Your physique, your own self-care. And it could be flipped on its head. I mean, it could be, you could be in the best shape of your life, you know, tracking all your macros, making sure that you're recovering between sessions, doing all these things, yeah. but at the cost of what? Yeah. So everything's in balance and you just need to decide what it is that you want and put your focus and attention in, into that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a nice way of looking at things. I think it's really interesting as well. And, and one thing as you were talking there, I suddenly had this epiphany. Remember when we were coaches, personal trainers, mm -hmm. and you know, those busy clients would come to us and we'd be like, come on, it's not that hard. Yeah. You'd be like, just, just go to the gym yeah. three times a week, mm -hmm. eat this. And you know, when I first started personal training 10 years ago, my nutrition plans back then, horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Like I was treating them like competitive bodybuilders, yeah. like it's crazy. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, I just don't understand. Like I was scratching my head every week. Yeah. I was like, why are these guys not, like I'm telling them what to do and they're yeah. just not doing it. Mm -hmm. But now the awareness of what goes on when I suppose your ego isn't so wrapped up on, a, yeah. on an individual thing. Yeah. And they're often, you know, they've got much more responsibility. They've often got kids, they're yes. married, they're often successful in business. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's so interesting to kind of look back on that with more perspective and be yeah. like, oh no. It makes you a better coach. It does. You know, you, you need, sometimes you need to go to places authentically where you are now the busy individual who maybe needs accountability with their training or whatever. Because 
when you can come from that place authentically, and that's often where a lot of PTs and online coaches go wrong, mm. is they're working with general population clients who've got kids, who've got work, who've got all these commitments and life stresses, and they are a young, fit, able-bodied personal trainer whose life is in the industry of health and fitness, yeah. and they have these expectations for their clients based on their own assumptions as, as to what's achievable, mm -hmm. and it's just not the reality. So, you know, it only makes you a better coach being in the position that you're in now where you are having to make decisions around where you put your focus and attention because you can empathize with clients and you can strategize with clients in a way that's more effective. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, it's all life experience. And you, you said to the point there that, you know, you look back at meal plans from 10 years ago or whatever, and they're almost laughable and, and they should be, you know, like uh, the LinkedIn um, founder said, if you're not embarrassed of your first version, then you, you launch too late. You know, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the done. It's like get it done and improve over time. And um, yeah, I, I think it's normal to look back and be a little bit embarrassed of that sort of, that sort of thing. Oh, definitely. definitely. Even if a couple of years ago, to be honest, yeah. each time, you know, some of the systems and stuff that I was using before I came on board with Supercharged mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. I look back on it now and I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> not just from a time efficiency point of view, but mm -hmm. just from a... You know, I was I was I was charging what I was worth back then. Yeah. But even still, from an online coaching point of view, people don't necessarily understand what online coaching is, yes. even now in the UK. Mm -hmm. So when you then just provide like a spreadsheet or just like a, a word document, you're yeah. like, oh, you know, it, it doesn't really sell. Yeah. It's not really a product, is it? No. Um, so looking back on that is 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 always interesting. Mm -hmm. Something you said there, I, I want to touch on because I'm very very guilty of it and especially recently is perfection has become my enemy mm. so um, we spoke in the week actually about social media and uh, I've just to be honest with you I got so disheartened with social media recently mm. one from a time point of view and I was just like I'm not getting the returns yeah. on investment of my time here yeah. um, but secondly really I've got these mics now Mm -hmm. And the reason why I wanted to get these mics was because in my head I was thinking the sound quality is terrible, the picture quality is terrible, yep. I just need to get something out there that is matching and then I can just blitz it. Yep. And for me, like I know now, it's the wrong way of doing things, I know, mm -hmm. but I know that now I've got these, I'm just going to smash out the reels. Yep. Because I just noticed that the engagement on any sort of post picture that I was doing was just plummeting yeah. further and further and further with any writing on it as well. Yeah. I was just like, how, how can I continue to keep doing this mm -hmm. when I'm getting less and less return? Mm -hmm. So I should have been like just posting these videos constantly, even throughout then, but I let that be the enemy. And I think that's the inner perfectionism, insecurity, however yeah. we want to describe that. Yeah. What advice would you give people to overcome that? I think it depends kind of where you're at in your in your journey for want of a better way of putting it like perfectionism can serve you incredibly well mm. if you're at a point where you've got all of your big rocks in place you're doing the fundamental things like if we use the example of social media for example for pts and online coaches if you're posting consistently you're putting value out you're putting social proof out you're calling people to action if you've got those big rocks in place perfectionism will serve you well because now you'll continue to do that hopefully but to a higher standard mm -hmm. which is only going to serve you well if you're a perfectionist and you don't have your big rocks in place, you're not posting consistently, you, you're not putting out regular value or social proof or calling your audience to action, and you're just waiting until everything's perfect until you do, mm -hmm. you're kind of like missing the wood for the trees. Mm -hmm. So again, like most things, life is in balance and perfectionism can serve you, but, sorry, perfectionism can serve you or it can be at the detriment to you and it's just all about where you are. It goes back to, to having a level of self-awareness where you can look at your situation subjectively and go, right now, is my inability to, to do this thing because I'm waiting for it to be perfect, is that serving me? Mm -hmm. Or could I be doing something that perhaps isn't the finished article right now that's going to move the needle forwards? Mm -hmm. And I think you can apply that to most things in life, like you know, waiting for the perfect time to start a training program or waiting for the perfect time to start losing weight. There's never really going to be a perfect time. You just got to get started and then improve as you go, you know? Um, so yeah, I think there's lots of crossover there. Do you find that the, I think something that I've struggled with 
uh, particularly with my own training, particularly with social media, particularly with business, the more that I've learned, the more I kind of like, it, it's more of a danger to me mm. because, and I'll explain this. So for example, with my own training, like when, before when I was a lot, way more ignorant and just, I would just yeah. get the sessions done. Yeah. Now with more knowledge on my shoulders, a wiser head, mm. or what I'd like to think of a, yeah. a wiser head, I get to the point now where I'm like, at the end of a, a long day and I'm tired, I know I haven't eaten enough, I'm like, this session is gonna be terrible. Yes. So like before I even get in the gym, I'm like, it's absolutely pointless because it's gonna wind me up. Yeah. And I think to a certain degree, I'm not sure whether it's perfectionism really that I'm suffering with. I think it might just be more of, I've got more awareness in a certain sector and I'm like, oh, if I don't do it this way, like the payoff isn't gonna be as good. So. I think in, in, it's definitely a hindrance, don't get me wrong, yeah. but I'm not sure whether perfectionism is the right word there. I think that kind of almost alludes to like the Dunning-Kruger effect in some ways, you know, like when you're down at the bottom of the Dunning-Kruger scale, you know, you think you know everything, but you know nothing. And that can actually serve people sometimes because that level of naivety, as you put it, that level of ignorance almost means that they're just blindly going along and they're, they're probably doing a lot of the wrong things, but they're also probably doing some of the things that are right and that are, are making them progress. But then as, you, as your knowledge increases over time and as you become more aware, you also become more aware of what you don't know. You know, like that's at the top of the scale of like, actually, I know nothing. And again, that can be a benefit. It can be a negative. It's all about perspective. Um, but you're right, like sometimes being equipped with knowledge doesn't serve you. Sometimes having a level of naivety, mm -hmm. like for example, um, starting supercharged and, and just running with it. If I had known what it takes now and, and, and the level of input that it requires, would I have potentially done it? Maybe not. It's like the, that level of ignorance that I had going into it was a benefit to me because I was just kind of, oh, it'd be fine, it'd be cool. You know, I just made like this rubbish Wix website and put up a couple of videos and away you go. So, you know, it can, can pay to your advantage to be naive in certain situations. But like you say, as you, as you learn more, it's like, oh shit, maybe I should yeah. be doing this, that or the other. It's so difficult. And I think that's, that when I've started to actually ponder on why I haven't been posting, mm. I think that's genuinely it because I'm like, at the moment, most of the stuff that I've got time for on a daily basis has been picture with text on it. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh. And then I do, I did a, a reel not too long ago. I put no effort into it whatsoever. Mm. And it just blew up. And I was like, oh yeah. my God. Yeah. So then when I realized and started to get it, I was thinking there's, it, there is very little, um, well, I'll, I'll correct that statement there's much more that I could be gaining by doing reels as opposed to just the, yeah. the photos. Yeah. And I've even said to you though, this is the messed up thing is I know that when I post regularly, business goes up. Yeah, there's like a really clear, distinct correlation. Yeah, mm. but I, I, for some reason, I still allow that to like, it's, it's a really complex, mm. I need to probably journal on that a little bit it's and figure out. But. so normal for coaches, just on that topic specifically with the posting consistently, for coaches to not view their social media content as part of their job. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they want to coach, they want to be working with clients, they want to do the programming, all of that stuff, and it makes sense. But the unfortunate reality, in particular with online coaching, you need an online presence. And yeah. so, you know, it's like what came first, the chicken or the egg? You, you can't have the clients if you're not doing the marketing, if you're not putting the socials out. So people need to start viewing it as part of their role as a coach is, you know, providing value and posting content on socials that needs to be ingrained into people. Mm -hmm. um, and what about um, something that I've, again, probably not struggled with, but I keep thinking as I'm putting out content, I always find myself thinking the trap of millions of people have said this. Mm. You know, and like I, I, I will put the content out, but I'm yeah. like, how can one, how can I make this different? Mm -hmm. But also, like, people are hearing this on a daily basis. Yeah. And I think, again, that falls into that Dunning Kruger effect of, yeah. you know, I've, I've said this for years now. Mm -hmm. I've been saying this for years now. Yeah. And people who have been following me, like, I, I, I think I overanalyze it, yeah. I overthink it, really. So normal. With the coaches that I speak to, and you've got to think I'm speaking to coaches every single day, mm -hmm. um, they all have this thing of like, I've said that before, or 
everyone else is saying that. Why, you know, and, and it becomes something that holds them back from, from putting it out. And what you've got to remind yourself of is a few things. Number one, the principles of what you're doing aren't changing. You know, and so you're not reinventing the wheel. When you're talking about weight loss, you're probably going to speak about calories. You're probably going to speak about energy expenditure. You're going to speak about these things. And so should we be striving for different ways to present it? Potentially, I honestly think that a lot of the, the difference just comes from your personality and letting your personality come across, mm -hmm. um, which is a big part of, of winning on socials is being your true authentic self. At the end of the day, the one thing that makes you unique is you. The one thing that's going to stand you apart from your competition is you. So do let that shine through. The other thing that I try and remind coaches of is that you're not trying to put a different message out all the time. You're trying to catch people at the time that they need you. Mm -hmm. So people might consume your content for years and have seen the same message that you post time and time again. But it's not until you frame it in a certain way or it's not until you say it at a point when they're ready to take an action that it causes the desired effect of somebody reaching out and asking for help. So you kind of need to get out of your own way with that whole thing of, I've said this before, everybody else is saying it. Let your, let your personality come across in your socials and that will make it individual enough, but don't be afraid about repeating yourself. Mm -hmm. So in terms of social media, where do you think the next like, opportunity is for big growth? I think that what we're seeing now is this huge, huge shift in terms of personal brand. And now more than ever, people have got this massive opportunity to achieve unbelievable things in their personal and business life through social media platforms, something that's never been available to people for years. You know, if you wanted to reach as many people as you do now, you had to be a celebrity and be on TV or be on the radio or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And certain people are going to get left behind because they've got all these limiting beliefs around speaking on camera, putting themselves out there, building their personal brand, giving people insight into their lives. And some people are going to grab it by both horns and make huge success of it, or at least stay current with the times. At the minute, it's short form video because platforms like Instagram and YouTube Shorts are trying to compete with TikTok, which has, um, you know, I guess the landmark on that, they have that territory, they've nailed it, that's where most of the eyes are. Um, so I really think that most coaches at the minute should be creating short form video content and sharing it to Instagram, TikTok, Facebook Reels and YouTube Shorts. Mm -hmm. That's where the attention is at the minute. Um, but if you're somebody listening to this or watching this who is reluctant to put themselves out there where you're speaking to camera or building your personal brand, the harsh reality is, is that you will be left behind if you're not going to do that. So you, you just kind of need to, again, get out of your own way and, and make that leap. Mm. How do you overcome a limited belief? Because again, I had this conversation. Um, I'm not sure whether it's environment mm. or birth. Yeah. And I change my opinion on this so often. Mm. And I think, I think there's a potential for growth. Yeah. My, my, my current opinion on this is um, there's potential for a growth mindset in everyone, yeah. but obviously your environment massively dictates it. Of course. So, you know, you are the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. Yeah. And I think that this year particularly, I've really noticed that. Mm -hmm. So with going to India, doing what I'm doing in India, with the clientele that I've got in India, yeah. it's unbelievable. Um, I thought I worked hard until I got to India. Mm -hmm. And these guys, I'll give you some perspective without using any names. The clients that I've got in India are in the medical field. Right. So they're surgeons, but they also own a ton of hospitals. Mm -hmm. They own uh, 125 hospitals in India. And the work rate that they have is unbelievable. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, they, they're on holiday at the moment and They'll be taking business meetings, they'll be doing calls, they'll be doing like basically working mm. and then sp finding time for the holiday, yeah. which for me has just been an amazing experience to be within that because 90% yeah. of my day I'm with those clients. Yeah. So I'm picking their brains constantly. I'm asking them about, you know, how they're doing, mm. what they're doing, um, how they've got to that point or position in their life. Mm. What do you think people can do? in order to help them with any limited beliefs? I think the first thing is really understanding what your limiting beliefs are. You know, 
um, a lot of coaches have a lot of limiting beliefs and just individuals in general. The most common ones that we see is nobody will pay that. If I, if I niche, then I'm going to close myself off to the market space and, and all these kind of things. So first and foremost, you need to actually be really hyper aware of what beliefs potentially are holding you back. And when you start to realize that, you can then almost unpack, well, where does that come from? Quite often, as you said, it's, it's a combination of nature and nurture. I think some people are born more risk averse than others. I think some people have been brought up in such a way where they've perhaps got poor money mindset because of how they were brought up around money. Um, one of my great mentors, Leslie Thomas, always speaks about our, our money story and how that's formed in our early years of childhood around how our parents behave with money. You know, was there a scarcity? Was there an abundance? Did you only get bought things on special occasions? And, and these things do start to impact us in our, mm -hmm. in our later years. But they can all be rewritten. You know, it, it starts with awareness and then it, it follows on with, you know, the pursuit of change. And that's not just paying lip service to it. It's seeking advice, seeking help getting a coach, a mentor, listening to podcasts, watching videos, you know, yeah. educating yourself. Um, because we really all do have the ability to achieve incredible things if we get out of our own way. And, um, you know, you spoke about spending time with these, these guys, these doctors who, who have these hospitals. And, you know, even if you're not learning things from them consciously like about conversations about how they got there and 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 all those kind of things subconsciously just you being in that environment where you see it where you can see their work rate where you can see how much effort they put in that is going to rub off on you so your environment is massively important and that's one of the things that we pay a lot of attention to in supercharged is making sure that you're in a group of people who all want more for themselves who support one another who have big goals and aspirations, and it just makes a massive difference to the way that you show up every day. Mm. So environment is huge for that. It really, really is. I think the big one at the moment is the impending doom of the recession. Yeah. You know, at the moment, that you look anywhere on the news right now, people are talking about it. Mm. And, and similar to lockdown, actually, because mm. everyone was panicking about different things then of like people not having money because, yeah. and, and the, where I'm going with this, I suppose, is when we are looking at limited beliefs, mm -hmm. you mentioned about pay rates yeah. and people paying out for different things. Mm -hmm. and, and something that I think it might have even been you that said this to me and it just everything just suddenly clicked. And I was like, yeah, I think you said that people will pay for what they value ultimately. Yeah. And it's the truest thing because people, most people's money story, as you've mentioned, is they get money and they want to get rid of it. Mm. That's what most people, they, you know, they have a plan to get rid of their money, yeah. you know, because um, a perfect example is someone will ask you, what would you do if you won the lottery? And that's one of my favorite questions to ask people now, because um, if like, for example, if I asked one of the clients that I've got in India, they would list off a totally different list yeah, of course. than someone with like a scarcity mindset. Yeah. And a scarcity mindset is really dangerous because it enables you to just basically go from uh, you know, winning like the Euro millions back to the same position that you were yes. in before yeah. because you haven't developed those tools. Yeah. You haven't learned how to actually get to that and keep that. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think there's a, I think it's most, if not all, lottery winners end up bankrupt. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a perfect story of um, how any limiting beliefs can really seriously affect you. Yeah. And the going back to my coaching business and my own mindset with money before India and, and when I first signed up with you, I, I'd been charging the same amount, which was like the industry standard. Yes. You know, that's the standard thing that everyone seems to do with online coaching. They look around, see what their competitors are charging and then, you know, just charge that because in my head I'd built up, yeah, but, you know, people like, you know, XYZ are char only charging yes. this. There's no way that I can charge more than that. Yeah. And I think um, working with you, it really made me recognize that actually my individual offering is completely different. Mm. You know, so for example, you could have a social media star with millions and millions of followers who's charging 120 quid, yeah. but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to bring the same value to the table. Exactly. So you could charge 200 quid yeah. and have much more value, much more contact points, much more interaction with your yeah. individual clients. And I think that then 
broke down that limited belief of, yeah, but if someone's paying X for that, they're not going to pay Y for me. Yeah. And my first price increase, I remember messaging you. I was like, oh, no, like I'm panicking. Yeah, yeah. Sweating on the call. Yeah, panicking about it. And, and actually, no one, no one had any problems with it. Mm. And I was just like, it blew it blew my mind a little bit because no one had an issue. I didn't raise it crazily. I think I raised it from, it might've been like 20 or 30 pound a month. Yeah. And even that then I was like, oh. You break down those barriers. Yeah, like, I was I like. I've done this sooner sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. And then again, now that I'm in India, something that they've really taught me is there's always going to be someone. Mm. And it depends, like you could be really, really high end and someone will pay that, but you've just got to find the yeah. person that's willing to pay it. Yeah. They have a, a, a child in a room with a, with a tester and um, they put a marshmallow down in front of the child and they say, I'm going to leave the room for 10 minutes. If you don't eat that, you can have two. And they followed those children, I believe. I can't remember the statistics exactly, but the majority of those kids that didn't eat the marshmallow and waited for the second one had much higher like progress throughout their life. So they were much more successful. Right. Um, they achieved higher grades in school. They were higher earners. And that blew my mind. Because mm. for a long time, like that was something that I really struggled with was like, yeah, this is amazing. Yeah. Like, just, like a marshmallow yeah. <laughs> straight in. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, how do you develop? What, where, where have you been in terms of delaying gratification and, and how have you developed that as you've gone through this process? Uh, I'm bad at it. To be honest with you, I'm bad at delayed gratification, you know, I'm, but I think consciously as well. I'm a massive, massive believer of like, I've got this like little mantra of future Ollie will sort it, future Ollie will deal with it, you yeah. know? So like a lot of people have, you know, the, the mindset of, well, if I do this, then what happens in a, you know, next month or in a couple of years time or, you know, and they, and they kind of get wrapped up in what's going to happen in the future but i have this kind of unwavering confidence and rightly or wrongly i could completely ruin it i don't know mm -hmm. but it's always served me up until this point of like future ollie will sort it out so if current ollie wants something and it's within means and it's not hurting anyone or whatever then go for it you know so I'm probably the worst example of delayed gratification, to be honest with you, but it's a conscious decision to be that way. Like I live in the moment. Um, I don't restrict myself of things if I don't have to, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a massive petrol head. I buy lots of cars. Luke can attest to the fact of how many cars I've got and had um, as a new car every so often. That's just my thing. I just love it, you know? And so I, I'm not a big believer of like um, putting things off if I don't have to. I live in the moment. That's interesting. I think um, I think it's it's interesting in the in the fact that I think there's probably from a like finance point of view, yeah. you probably, as you've said, aren't as good in terms of it because that's your interest. Yeah. But I think probably business wise, mm. you're probably still doing it without realizing it. So like you're focusing more on like the business element rather yeah. than you know, for example, Netflix yes. or you know, those sorts of things. Mm. So I think it just all depends on going back to whatever you value, you will, yeah. you will spend the money on. Yeah, there's no right or wrong answer. There's no blueprint. Quite often, the problem with marketing is, is that polarizing sells. Mm -hmm. So unless it's an extreme viewpoint either way, it doesn't really get any attention. So what we see on like social media, et cetera, is people with really extreme opinions getting lots of traction. And so quite often the content that you consume and the ideologies that you consume yeah you should be a certain way, you should do this, you should do that. They're all very polarizing and they're all very extreme opinions and that's why they've got traffic because mm -hmm. it does cause engagement, it does cause conversation and so it ends up higher up in your feed and you consume it and you see it. But I know for a fact that there's more than one way of doing things. Yeah. Some people are super, super frugal. They like to live a really modest lifestyle and that is absolutely cool. Some people like to live with abundance. They like to buy nice things. They like to do whatever. That is also absolutely cool. I think at the core of what you do, if you have noble intention and you've got people's best interests at heart and you're not screwing yourself over, like there has to, so there needs to be a prerequisite to this. 
you've got to have your other things in line. Like mm -hmm. I, that's bad advice if you're not paying your taxes, yeah. you're late on payments on bills and all that, those kind of things. You need to have good finances, of course, but I'm a believer of, and this is just my opinion, it's not right or wrong. If you can afford something and you actually want it, like actually want it, not because you want to show off, not because you want to project something on someone else, mm -hmm. then buy it. You know, that's just my opinion. So, yeah, I think it's funny, like the, the different sides to that story that you see on socials, etc. cetera. But um, yeah, I've just always been that way. Mm. And where did you learn? Uh, so from my own backgrounds, I didn't really have much of a financial education. Yeah. In terms of my upbringing, um, my mum and dad, very middle class mm. and they just didn't really have, they're not, they're not entrepreneurs, they didn't yeah. have any business yeah. savvy, um, not that that's an issue, no. but going into then running my own business, all of a sudden being in a position where earning potentially a lot more mm. than I was, mm. you know, when I, I, I started my career off at Nuffield Health, yeah. you know, uh, you know what it's like, yeah. mainstream gym, mm. terrible pay for the yes. hours that you work. Yeah. And then going to being self-employed all of a sudden was a big jump for me in terms of finances. I was yeah. now getting 100% of what yeah. my clients were paying. And um, it was, I got it wrong, very wrong mm -hmm. at the start. Mm -hmm. Where did you first learn about nu uh, nutrition? Uh, when did you learn about your like finances and, yeah. and know-how with that? Yeah, similar to you, dude. I, I made mistakes early on in, in the PT business. Um, you know, really successful couple of first few years, um, a little bit slower to begin with, but then it's like year two, three and so on, really, really successful as a, as a personal trainer and making more money than I could shake a stick at. But no clue how to manage it, no clue about taxes or VAT or any of that stuff. And so made lots of mistakes. And so a lot of my learning really has come from making mistakes, which is probably how most people learn. Um, and then as I start to progress more and more and I got coaches and I got mentors and you start paying interest into different things, you start learning different things. And so I think we're all on this kind of continuum of developing and learning in those areas. And again, I'm by no stretch of the imagination the finished article with it. I still make mistakes today. Mm -hmm. um, so perhaps not the best advice to be giving, but sometimes making the mistakes need to happen because when it happens, I mean, I can remember back when the first year that I made six figures, I hadn't put enough tax money away. I didn't have a system in place for tax yeah. money. And when the HMRC bill came through the door, like I thought my life was over. I thought I was gonna to have to go bankrupt. I didn't know how I was gonna come up with the money, mm -hmm. but I needed that to happen to me because now I have solid systems in place to make sure that never happens again. So mm -hmm. that was the best learning for me. Um, not recommending that you do that, but mm -hmm. you know, that, that's just part of life, isn't it? And, I, I really now look at life, and again, this is probably not great advice, but I look at it all as a big game, mm -hmm. like tax and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, we have to pay it, but it's not real life. Mm -hmm. Like, who cares? Like, if you fuck it up somewhere down the line, you'll figure it out, you'll be fine. You're not gonna get put in prison unless you're like money laundering and stuff. Like, you'll figure it out. You'll probably make mistakes. You probably won't save enough. You probably will overspend or, that's fine, it's not real life. This is all just like a big game. We're not here for long. Just enjoy it while you can and, and, and do the best that you can with the knowledge you've got. That's it. Yeah, I love that. I think, um, so really, I think for me, it came from initially people that inspired me. Mm. So I like when I first got into personal training, I was looking for people that were, um, I guess, where I wanted to yeah. be. And then as things progressed and, you know, I started to take the business side of things more seriously mm -hmm. because as a personal trainer, you're just like, oh, I'll pick up another client. Yeah. You don't really, or I didn't anyway, focus on the like business as yeah. such. Like I was just constantly like, yeah, I want another client or yeah. I want to be fully booked. So like, that was the aspiration mm -hmm. back then. Um, but as I started to kind of recognize and make some mistakes, I was like, oh, there's definitely a better way of doing yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to be stressing out about like yeah. my tax bill at the end of every year. Yeah. I started to look at guys who were like financial, not advisors, but mm. people that were more savvy in that sector. Yeah. And I came across um, a book by Tony Robbins called Unshakable. Mm. I don't know if you've, if you've not read it, read no, it. It's great. Um, really good for investing and kind of touches on business a little bit. 
but then that kind of opened up the door to I actually had no idea mm. that this could actually happen. Yeah. And it opened up my eyes to investments and uh, the power of compounding and all that sort of stuff. Mm. And I was just like, I've been told all my life yeah. that this is a minefield mm. because my, my mum, like I said, my mum and dad weren't doing it. Yeah. And my nan and granddad, you know, those investments, it was just all savings accounts. Yeah. They didn't understand like the power of compounding in the stock market and all yeah. that sort of stuff. And I was like, oh my God. And then I started to speak to people, started to get involved in mm. Uh, more mentors and uh, just books like I just yeah. audio books I'll be honest with you though yeah, because cool. like yeah. sitting reading, down and reading. reading about finances is not fun yeah and um, so I guess my question to you is what where do you see the priority list of learning do you think it comes um, you know books as an entry level and then mentors or do you think people should look straight for a mentor yeah I'm I'm a mass it, it would I'd be a huge hypocrite if um, I didn't believe in mentorship enough to do it myself like I've invested thousands and thousands of pounds over the years in in mentorships um, I think they're obviously you know it would be a smart thing to suggest that you need to be in a financial position where mentorship is affordable for you because they are expensive because of the value that they provide mm -hmm. um, so I would never recommend anyone put themselves in a in a dangerous position financially by investing in mentorships but they they are incredible you know mm -hmm. um, Actually, I put my first mentorship on a credit card, which I don't advise anyone to do, but I did do that. Um, it did pay off. But um, yeah, mentorships are a great way of just essentially fast tracking your results because you bypass all of the common mistakes that most people make. Mm -hmm. But as you said there, books, podcasts, they can be incredible resources and you can learn from some of the best people in the world that can help you with these things. The, the trouble with them, I feel, and this is quite often the conundrum that most coaches face is, with those free resources, quite often they're information and mentorship and good coaching is implementation. And that's the difference quite often between people getting the result and not getting the result. You know, all the information is out there. Mm -hmm. Whether or not you have the skin in the game, just from listening or reading those resources to then go and do the thing that you need to do is, is the question, you know. Mm. And what, where do you see, because I think something that's shifted massively for me over the last 12 months is the difference between spending mm. or my framing on spending mm -hmm. and investing. Yeah. And I think that probably still, for want of a better word, goes back to my programming from my own yeah. earlier days. Yeah. Um, when I start to look at stuff for the business now, I'm like, I've got to really be conscious of, mm. I'm not spending this money. Like as long as I'm investing it and yes. it's got a good ROI, yeah. I'm absolutely fine with it. Like mm. it doesn't make a difference to me. Yeah. But for a long time, it was something that I really struggled with because I was like, you know, uh, recently, for example, I've just um, invested in a new accountant. Mm. Incredible. Mm. Set up my LTD, mm. saved me a ton of tax. Mm. And realistically, I pay him a monthly figure, but that's been, even over the 12 months now, my initial savings on tax yeah. has covered that. Yeah, of course. So anything else now, yeah is, is just is. a value add. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And I think I, th I viewed it the same when I first approached you, because I was like, okay, fine. It's X amount, mm -hmm. but what's the potential? Yes. And, I, and that, you touch on something that I think is really important to say of, you know, obviously you need to make sure that you're in a financial position to do so. Yeah. But also the way that I look at it as well is, are you in a financial position to not? Yeah, really, really good point. Because if it's, if it's genuine, and, and I suppose the key here is if they're a genuinely good coach or mentor, yes. that's where it makes a big difference. Yes. Because if someone, can, if, you, if someone can take you from where you currently are and say, look, you know, I've got a track record of taking people from X to X, yeah. and this is where you want to be, mm -hmm. can you afford not to do that? Yes. Can exactly. you afford to be in the same position in six months or 12 months or yeah. two years when you finally go, yeah. okay, based off my previous behavior, mm -hmm. I'm probably not gonna earn any more money because I've got a limited belief structure at the moment. Yeah. Dan, do you wanna come on and be a salesperson for Supercharged? Yeah, let's do it, <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> we'll let's get you on commission base and you can just use that line and then yeah. we're, we're in. We're, yeah, we'll we're clip it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, you're 100% right and that there is this saying flying around like people often look at the cost of a coach or a mentor or whatever, but they don't look at the cost of being in the same position a year from now, you know, and, and sometimes you do need to step back and look at things that way. Um, like I said, I put my first mentorship ever on a credit card 
because I had confidence in the mentor to not only pay that debt off, but to then get to where I wanted to be in the shortest time frame possible. So look, it takes due diligence. You have to do your research. You need to make sure it's credible. I recommend going speaking to, if you're looking at mentorships or coaches, to go and look at or speak to previous clients or current clients, get an insider scoop. Don't just be sold on the word that you hear on social media or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if you do your market research and you're willing to put the elbow grease in and, and, and do what's required of you, then quite often, I mean, this stuff isn't rocket science. It's about my, my current mentor, the, the, the best thing that he taught me about coaching in general is that coaching is all about changing belief systems. Mm -hmm. It is all about changing belief systems. You think about any incredible result that you've had with clients, any incredible transformations you've had, or even if you're in your own coaching experience, with me, for example, mm -hmm. All of the best outcomes have come from changing belief systems. Mm. And, um, you know, the, the, the kind of result is there to be had as long as you are open-minded and you can listen to your coach, you can achieve the outcome, you know, um, and a good mentorship will achieve that for you. So. Mm. so what else do you do? This is really interesting, actually, because this is one thing that I really like to, to break down with people is supercharge is obviously a massive part of you. Yeah and what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. What else do you enjoy and what else are you kind of working on behind the scenes if you don't mind? Yeah, in terms of working on, nothing really. Uh, myself and my partner Kat are starting a HMO business, so we're buying property and getting tenants and that kind of thing, which is cool. That's just a nice way of, again, investing some money and um, le relatively um, low input our end. Obviously, there's gonna be some stuff from a landlord perspective that we'll have to do there. Um, but really, and I'm a massive advocate of having one thing. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of people have got all of these different projects going on. They're, they're got fingers in this pie. They're trying this new venture. And it's like the shiny object syndrome of like, what else can I do? And the reality is, is that what I've noticed over the years, the most successful people and the people who do the best put a lot, if not all of their attention and focus into one thing. And they do that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm trying to stay true to that myself with supercharged put all of my eggs into that basket so to speak yes we do the hmo thing it's, it doesn't take too much input from us but outside of that i mean to be honest i'm quite a boring person i don't really do much to be honest with you i um yeah i spend i spend all of my free time with my family um if i'm not with my family i'm working on the business so i i kind of see it as short-term sacrifice i'm in the years of my life now where i can afford to double down and work hard so that later on in life I can relax and that's not really like me I'm very much live in the moment kind of guy mm -hmm. but I know when I've got a good thing and I, I want to ride this way for as long as I possibly can because who knows what the mentorship or coaching space looks like in five years time you know so um, I am just riding the wave while I can and, and helping as many people as I can along the way so that's kind of where I'm at, dude. I'm a boring guy. Yeah. yeah. I, um, you touched on something there that's interesting, and I've noticed it myself. You said a wave. Mm. And it's, it's, it's a really bizarre thing where you notice momentum in a certain area. Mm. And at the moment, like I'm experiencing something similar where yeah. I'm noticing certain things are going very, very well. Yeah. And I want to double down on it. How do people... It, I mean, it's easy to say, yeah, you just notice it, right? Mm. But where does that like intuitive process come from where you're like, this, this momentum, mm. or I'm starting to notice a buildup of focus, attention, mm. however you want to label that. Yeah. How do people start to tune into that a little bit sooner? I think, it's, uh, I think it comes down to, at the core of it all, having one thing that you focus on and I think people, and unfortunately the kind of culture that we live in at the minute, people have really high expectations. It's like the kind of Amazon Prime kind of culture, isn't it? Where they want things and they want it fast. And so I, I think if you get really good at focusing with, with low expectations, not to say that you don't aspire for big things. I think there's a misconception that if you have low expectations, you're not aspirational or you don't want grand things for yourself or for your people, that's not the case. It's about going into something with low expectations. A lot of people get into online coaching thinking they're going to make 10K months in no time at all because that's what marketing around mentorship is. Oh, you know, make 10K in 90 days or less. And it's just quite often not the case. Mm -hmm. 
So if you go into something and you're willing to do the work and you're willing to be consistent over a period of time with low expectations, you will smash it. It's the people that come in with high expectations who quite often don't meet those expectations who are miserable mm. because it's their reality not meeting their expectations. So I think that's a massive one. Have one thing that you want to focus on that you're passionate about that can pay you. Mm. Go in with the right expectations and go in with the willingness to commit to it for a prolonged period of time and you, you can't do more than that. I think it's something that a lot of people struggle with. Um, I had a conversation with one of my friends the other day who is employed but wants a little bit of a side hustle. Mm. And that's become a very trendy thing yeah. recently. Um, and I think that, that with online coaching specifically, I think a lot of people get into it mm. because they see the numbers that some people are turning over. Yeah. Yeah. And it becomes a very glamorous sector yeah. to, to kind of be in. Mm. Um, and I've said to, you know, there's a few PETs that I know who have been like, I'm going to jump on online. And I'm like, with the greatest of respects, you need to do your time in the trenches. Yeah. You need to yeah. learn the trade because online is difficult. Mm. It's difficult to be able to serve someone without being physically there. You've yes. got to have the skill set yeah. and understanding that when they're just physically checking in with you, you've yeah. got to know the patterns that lead to mm. those reporting structures that they'll yeah. give back to you. And I think a lot of people particularly will get into it for the wrong reasons. Yeah. They're just chasing money. Mm -hmm. And they're not necessarily as passionate about maybe serving people or fitness or mm. whatever. They're just literally looking at it as a, I can make 10K a month, yeah. for example. Yeah. Where do you, where's the balance of that? Because obviously we need, as a business, as a person, we need to make money. Mm. Um, where do you see that in terms of passion mm. and also making money? Where, where's that balance? Yeah, I think it, they have to come hand in hand because without the passion, the ability to make good money is not going to be there because ultimately you just end because let's make no bones about it like taking online coaching for example it's not as glamorous as people make out it's a glorified office job yeah you'll be pulling your hair out more often than not because clients want to pause or they want to leave or they're having a meltdown and you're screwing their head back on and you're at the desk for hours like full-time online coach isn't desirable as many people think does it offer you some flexibility and freedom in terms of where you work? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, can, do you have infinite more ability to make more money than online, uh, in-person personal training? Yeah, of course you do. But there are downsides as well. So I often ask people like, why do you want to do online coaching? What is the, at the core of making this transition from personal training? What is it that you want? Mm -hmm. And we need to be really, really clear on that because when you're clear on it, you can handle the difficult times a little bit more. You can handle the long hours, you can handle the dry spells with no inquiries online. If not, like a lot of coaches just aren't suited to it and they should just be personal trainers and accept that, you know, that's that's kind of what they're destined for. That's fine, there's nothing wrong with that at all. I don't know where personal training lost its street cred. It's, it's a great profession. Personal training's dead, didn't you know? <laughs> it really, really isn't. I absolutely hate that saying. Um, but yeah, it's almost become uncool, hasn't it? Yeah, it To really be has. a personal trainer, it's almost like frowned upon. Like, why? It's such an incredible career. You, you, you work in a, a core environment, you're in a gym, you get to see people that you build a connection and rapport with every single day. You're meeting new people, learning from them, and you're changing people's lives for the better in terms of their health and their fitness. And it's just like, I don't know where it lost its credibility, but it, people need to get back on board with the idea that PT is a, a great job. It's much more sociable. Mm. I remember when I shifted from PT to purely online, I'd like did my first full day at work at, at home in the office, and I was like, I've not spoke to anyone all day. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I was used to speaking to like hundred people or yeah. something, like even if it was just like, oh hi. Yeah. And then literally just sat at my desk, and then I actually realised I had this moment of like clarity where I was like. I started personal training, so I wasn't doing this. Yeah. What has happened? I'm now sat at a desk circle, all day. Full circle. Yeah. 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 And this is where you go, it comes back to being really clear on why do you want to do it? If somebody comes to me and they say, I just want to make more money, then pff, yeah, online coaching is probably the way to go. Mm -hmm. You know, if, there, if there's more to it than that for you, then you, you really need to dig deeper and understand like, do I actually want to do online coaching or am I just on this bandwagon trend of everyone's doing it so I feel like mm -hmm. I should? So um, yeah, it's, it's really common at the minute of people wanting to jump ship. So I think there is a lot of misconceptions because uh, especially now with me being in India, 
people think that I'm just sat on the beach, mm. like with a pina colada, like yeah. sipping it and, yeah. uh, you know, just working on my laptop. And do you know what? I actually tried, I can't sit my laptop. No. It's like the worst thing to ever do. You cannot work outdoors. No, I tried it as well, actually. I went on holiday recently to Dubai. It was like a working trip. And I tried to take one of my group calls on the laptop on the sun lounger and the, the, the laptop was a hundred degrees, yeah. a sweat dripping into my eyes. And I was like, actually the laptop lifestyle on the beach just isn't really a thing at all. It really isn't, it's not practical. Yeah. So um, yeah, I get that. That was, uh, I think uh, the four hour work week uh, yeah. put that in my head a little bit too much. Yeah. Cause yeah. I literally was like, oh, wicked, I can do that. And then yeah. when I actually tried it and the reality, as you said, like I couldn't touch my laptop because it was so hot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it was telling me I needed to get, like cool it down yeah. and couldn't see. So yeah, yeah it's not the, great. Nah. So what is, what is the long-term goal for you? Where do you see yourself in 10, 15, 20 years? Uh, I typically don't look that far ahead. I probably look maybe three or four years ahead. Mm -hmm. I think um, Supercharger is only growing. It's only getting better. Um, that what we deliver is improving all the time. I'm really excited, excited to start the, the kind of property portfolio side of things with the HMOs, etc. So I've only really looked that far ahead. But for me, as I said previously, I'm really just riding this wave with, with coaching. Like it's unbelievably fulfilling for me, even more fulfilling than personal training and online coaching was. Mm -hmm. Like I used to always think that like getting people in great shape and improving their health and their confidence is like the most fulfilling thing. And it really is. But, mm -hmm. you know, getting messages from mentees who've like put deposits down on their first house that they never thought they would be able to get or yeah. clearing their debt or not worrying about money anymore, or whatever their, their kind of win is. It's like so, so rewarding. So yeah, it's just like the, the best of both worlds for me at the minute, and I'm, I'm just loving it. So I don't see that changing anytime soon. Yeah, and I think, I think it's, it's right. The money isn't everything, but worrying about money yeah. is a big thing. Mm. I mean, most people stress about money issues of one form yeah. or another, especially yeah. with the impending situation. Yeah. Um, so if you can be in a situation now where you don't necessarily stress about money. Yeah, I can imagine that's ridiculous. We need rewarding. to just put some context on recession as well, because like you, you hear that word and it sounds really doom and gloom. And yeah, don't get me wrong. Like we don't want to be in a recession, but recession is essentially two back-to-back -back quarters in which the GDP has gone down in value. That's mm -hmm. what it is. Mm -hmm. And when you take it on face value, is that you go, oh right, okay. Yeah. So the GDP has gone down in value for two consecutive quarters and that does impact our day-to-day -day living, but it's not as doom and gloom for coaches as they think it is. Mm -hmm. What you have to remember as a coach, as a personal trainer, is that what you offer is a luxury item in and of itself. So typically people who are investing in coaching, they're not gonna be the sort of people that are gonna be hard done by the recession. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're in a position where you're thinking about coaching in the first place, you're probably not the sort of person who is worried about cost of living going up. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't affect you, or it may affect you in some ways, but you're gonna be fine, is the point I would make there. Mm. And I think the biggest thing that I've learned over the years is most successful people make the most amount of money in a recession. Yeah, of course. And that as well completely changed and, 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 and emphasized, actually, it isn't all doom and gloom. No. Um, but you know, you are right. I think a lot of people will be thinking, you know, oh no, people don't have that money yeah. now. Situations are changing. Mm -hmm. um, and also we had a conversation not too long ago. I mean, I don't mind talking about it where um, one of my clients had a bit of a, a head, head mm -hmm. moment where they were all like, oh, I don't know what's going on. And they, they panicked. Mm -hmm. And um, I think running a business, you have to be very good at establishing boundaries and you know these are the things that you signed up for x amount yeah and you know having that conversation mm -hmm. and you know obviously leading with care and trying to cool. best serve the client yeah. is is paramount there um, but having that ability to be able to do that and mm -hmm. go through that as well mm -hmm. again it's just a testament to the whole mentor and mentee relationship because yeah. i think if i had not have had you in that moment mm -hmm. i would have gone well yeah, actually, you know, you back down the situation has changed yeah. for a lot of people and yeah. I've started to rationalize yeah. in my head, oh God, yeah, no, actually, yeah. a lot of people might not be in that position now. When it comes to people pausing and canceling and things of that nature, quite often the way that I like to think of it is like, 
is them leaving you right now serving them? Are you doing them a disservice by them, you know, having a, a funny five or a wobble or whatever and wanting to leave? Are you doing them a disservice by letting them walk away? And quite often you are. Quite often in these times they need your support more than ever. And so, you know, it actually pays in both of your favours to dig your heels in and say, we made a commitment to one another. You made a commitment to me. I made a commitment to you. We're going to see this through. Mm -hmm. You're going to get over the other end and you're going to be in a better place for it. And so you do need to be a little bit robust in those situations sometimes. And you, you did it perfectly and, and came out the other side. So that's cool. Mm. Yeah, it was, it, was a, it was an interesting experience because, again, it was historically, I think I've just always let people just like when they said they cancelled, I mean, like, OK, cool. Like, I yeah. respect that. Yeah. That's fine. Yeah. Um, but this was kind of the first experience. And then it was funny because the following two, three weeks, I had a few examples where it was almost exactly the same situation. Yeah. Yeah. And then again, just dealt with it in the same way. Yeah. And then I just thought, how many people have I potentially not served properly in yes. the past? Yeah. And almost being like a bit of a yes man, like, oh yeah, yeah okay, fine. Yeah. Well, you've got to think why them. you've got to think why your clients come to you in the first place. You know, they they come to you ultimately because they don't have the intrinsic ability to do it for themselves. They need someone to help them, they need someone to support them, someone to hold them to a higher standard than they currently hold themselves. Mm -hmm. And so you rolling over and, and dying when they, when they tap out or, or, or put, throw the white towel in, like that's not you doing your job. You know, you've got to be quite firm and go, we said we were going to do this thing. Are we doing it? Because at the minute, you know, you're, and, and so having those difficult conversations serves both of you really well. You know, you keep your business, where it needs to be and they get what they came to you for in the first place. Yeah, I think it's, in, in fitness, it's, it, it's, it's almost easier, I think, because I've been doing that for years. Yeah. But that was the first example where it was like, okay, I've, I need to stand my ground with this because mm. it's not stand my ground, that's not the right way of um, describing it, but be firm with them. Yeah. Um, because when, you know, ultimately, if you're holding someone accountable, mm. It came naturally to me, like, you know, you're not getting to the gym, what's going on? Yeah. Yeah, you're not eating them like you're not sticking to the calories that we've set. You know, yeah. we had a discussion, we've we've made it as accessible and, yeah. and as sustainable as we can. What's going on? Yeah. So then like, you know, finances, I think it was just another level of an extension of that. Yeah. But I just never challenged it. Yeah. So it was it was like I went into it like mm. the, the reality is is that most of your clients will use finances as an excuse to opt out for reasons outside of that. Mm -hmm. It's the easiest thing because they feel like it's an easy get out of jail free card. That's not how it works. You know, it, it, quite often if they've made a commitment to do something, they've already projected that they can afford it for that period of time. And they're just looking for an easy out. And if you're the kind of coach who is a pushover, who just lets people do that, then like I say, you're, you're probably doing them a disservice as well. That's really interesting. Mm. Dude, thank you so much for this. It's Pleasure. been interesting. And, uh, we'll have to do it again, I think. Yeah, 100%. I'll come to Brum next time, so yeah, you don't yeah, have to yeah. make the journey. Yeah, yeah. Well, or India. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not India. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. Thank you, though. Cool. Pleasure.